Hey everybody, welcome to the Rotowire Monday Fantasy Football Podcast. Uh, we are summing up Week Seven, a disastrous Week Seven for both Chris and I. Uh, not in personal terms. Chris had a wonderful weekend. Uh, family went away, so he had a party at Ber- weekend at Bernie's. Uh, but- no, no, no. First of all, uh, first of all, weekend at Bernie's is not a fun party. If you no, it's movies. not. But it, it was <laughs> is an attempt at Sec- one. Secondly, uh, my family is going away now. They were not. They were here this weekend. Okay, they just left uh, today. They I got left. you earlier today. I drove them out with my reaction to week seven. Ah, yeah. Well, okay. Let's talk about why it was such a disaster. It's pretty obvious. I mean, OBJ first of all out for the season, torn ACL, didn't have the decency to have a good game before he got hurt. No. You know, first offensive play of the game. Tried to make a tackle on an interception. Uh, I mean, that's about yeah. the worst possible way. That's really what it is, is that it's, he wasn't even making a catch. It was just so gratuitous and stupid. Just who just pull an A.J. Green, stay out of the way. Uh, so that was really, really bad. And then, uh, yeah, that Ronald Jones basically looking like the turning the corner to be a reliable every week back and then drops a pass. Fournette comes in and plays great. That was horrible. Debo Samuel, who I waited four or five weeks for, uh, hurts his hamstring during a blowout. That was horrible. I picked up Jeff Wilson, genius that I am, but but I didn't start him because I didn't know that McKinnon was getting a day of rest because nobody knew that. And I actually did start McKinnon in another league, started Latavius Murray over Jeff Wilson. Then I was like, well, you know, I didn't start him, but at least like going forward, this could be really valuable. Hurts himself out probably a few weeks at least. So that's that was worthless. Uh, my uh, I had Denver uh, plus... Nine and a half as my best bet. They're down 10-6. They're sacking Mahomes. They're moving the ball. And I'm going against the Chiefs defense in a high-stakes league. Pick six. Okay, fine. Denver gets the ball, drives down, kicks a field goal. 17-9, kickoff, return touchdown. That's it. That's it for my Melvin Gordon share. I started Gordon over James Robinson foolishly. Then Gordon's game flow got destroyed. Then he decided to do a uh, flea flicker flip over Drew Locke's head. That just made it worse. I could go on and on. I mean, there there are so many things that happened, and it was just like one after another after another. And I'm watching in disbelief, just thinking, you know, what is my purpose on planet Earth? Like, why am I watching this? What what is the point of doing this? And uh, by the end, I was I was in a pretty sour mood to the point where I just kind of checked out, talked to Heather for a bit, went to sleep, and when I woke up this morning to take the dog out. At first, I was like, yeah, I'm a little tired, but I feel all right. And then it all came like roaring back, like a, <laughs> like a bad a bad night of drinking where you, you know, started to curse out somebody. And there was some, you know, you uh, you hit on the wrong person it was in my single days. Um, and, you know, it was a total disaster. And that, that's what it felt like. It came rushing back, all the misery and horrors of the night before. Oh, yeah. And I'll tell you what, I, you know, similar experiences. So. My primetime team, really good team, was heretofore a really good team, and now it's in shambles. Yeah. Mixon, hurt. Miles Gaskin on by. Okay, normally, hey, great. I made a great pickup. I'll have him as a bye week fill in, so it shouldn't hurt that much. No, I needed him. This was my bye week fill in. I yeah. needed him this week. Uh, no, uh, Josh Jacobs, terrible matchup. Rojo drops a pass, then Fournette takes over. OBJ, CD Lamb, one catch. Oh. And then DK Metcalf in the nightcap. I'm like, or at least I'll have Russell and DK Metcalf. I'll get 130 and get out of here. You know, I'll be all right. No, no. I got two catches. I had a touchdown called off. You know, it's just ludicrous. It's just everything went wrong. You know, Mark Andrews was on by. So, okay, I, at least I had Hawkinson. That was my one good player. You know, I what, picked or Russell Derek Wilson too. for Mark Andrews in two leagues. He got me zero. And then I'll, I'll one-up you on Metcalf. Well, I needed also. Not only did he do nothing. And the TD got called back. The one great play he made was on Buda Baker, who had an easy pick six, but Buda Baker was jogging because he didn't think some, you know, as you said, Usain Bolt type guy is going to run out of nowhere and get him. And that was an ex- a six points desperately needed in the stake league. I was starting Buda Baker in an IDP league. So not only did DK Metcalf not produce for my NFFC team where I desperately needed him to, he actually interfered with another league. He personally intervened yep. and cost me six points in another league while doing nothing for me in the league that I used them. 
He's like, if they're not going to throw it to me, nobody's scoring. Screw that. No, yeah. I have no, uh, team player. I've got a, a different league, a super flex league with both Kyler Murray and uh, Wilson, which I, you know I'm not complaining because they've been very good to me. But that sequence of Wilson getting, you know, Wilson getting picked off, and then Arizona not being able to convert into points at the other end where Murray was actually losing yards. It's like, ugh, ridiculous. Yeah, you're probably all right with those two guys in a super flex. It's almost like you'd have to have botched the rest of your team so entirely. Do you know that, like, Murray and Wilson, Wilson's played, I think, six games. Murray's played seven. They're both, like, top three all time in QB scoring over those spans. I know. It's ludicrous. All time. It's ludicrous. Like, in the history of football. And I think, I don't know, it was Scott Barris. Somebody posted this on Twitter. I can't remember who. I like to give him credit. Maybe it's Tristan Cockroft. There's somebody who, like, compiles stats like that. And he said something like the, the number of quarterbacks that have had, you know, whatever, 40 or 50, whatever the number is, whatever the threshold is, point weeks from like 1989 to 2009 is like the same amount as they've had so far this year or something crazy. Wow. That's amazing. It is amazing. Uh, so there's a lot of other stuff going on. Uh, you know, you know, we mentioned that. Let's just talk Cowboys for a second. They're a disaster. This was this beautiful offense. Yeah, it had some problems, but Dak helped it overcome. And now it's completely off the rails. It went from a top five, top three offense. One of the best, Dak had the hottest start of all time, you know, to now it's ruined everybody. You know, you know, the Amari Cooper might not be ruined. Zeke isn't ruined, but he's definitely lessened. But C.D. Lamb, Michael Gallup, you can't use them. And I don't know what I'm going to do going forward, especially now that I lost OBJ. I think I still have to just cross my fingers and hope. Yeah, you're going to use – I mean, I would use C.D. Lamb probably. It depends. But it's it's all very downgraded. And, uh, you know, Dalton's out probably for a week or two also. So, I mean, I forget the name of the guy who took over, like a rookie seventh rounder. But ben DiNucci. Ben DiNucci. Uh, who knows? He never, you know – Romo was undrafted, but the offensive line, you know, we were talking about this on the XM show, but people say, oh, running backs don't matter, and you get into all that BS about, you know, it's just stupid. But, I mean, I, I could argue that quarterbacks don't matter, and that seems ridiculous. You're like, quarterbacks, that's all that matters. That's the most important position. But if you look at it, like the quarterback is, unless it's a transcendent quarterback, which there's only a handful, he's as good as his offensive line. Look at Baker Mayfield how well he played against the Bengals. Baker Mayfield, in my opinion, is not a very good quarterback. But when he had time to throw and he had uh, a cornerback to pick on, or maybe more than one, uh, he was just able to go 22 for 23 after his cold start, and the, and the one miss was a spike, and five touchdowns it, to, to a bunch of scrub receivers. You know, no Hooper, no Beckham. And he lit it up. And I just think, like, when you have – any you know comp reasonably competent NFL quarterback and Mayfield's probably the floor of that uh, and he's got great protection he's going to do well and so the, the but the the converse is also true that if you have any non transcendent quarterback and maybe Dak is even better than we realize and they're behind a terrible offensive line uh, it they're not going to do anything and it doesn't really matter so in that sense the quarterback doesn't really matter except at the extremes, the extremely great quarterback who's going to do it no matter what, the extremely bad quarterback who can't do it no matter what, and then the extreme offensive lines where the offensive line is so good or so bad. But like it, pretty much the quarterback is just dependent, so dependent on having time to throw. And what do the best defenses do? They get to the quarterback. What they basically do is they create the condition that makes it impossible for the quarterback to do what he's practiced. And on the show, I was talking about tennis – and you're more of a tennis player than me, Jeff, but I played a little tennis. Mm -hmm. And if you ever take a tennis lesson, they hit it right to you and you step into it and you, you, you know, you're hitting line drive perfectly over the net. But then if you get in a real match and someone's, you know, lobs it deep and you're like at your backhand and the, the ball's bouncing over your head, it's not easy to hit a good stroke. And so, you know, that's the difference between a good tennis player. Right? Anybody can swing at an easy ball, but you know, what do you do when it's not set up for you? And I feel like the best defenses put quarterbacks in a position where they're swinging at a really difficult ball all the time, and most of them can't do it. But you put any quarterback in an easy situation, they're going to look really good. And so the, these offensive lines in Dallas, in Cincinnati, Giants, Jets, um, there's, no, there's no fixing the QB problem until that's fixed. I think you're probably right about that. Uh, and also, uh, you know, there's, when you don't have a good pass rush, 
it really exposes your DBs a lot too. Seattle didn't touch Kyler Murray in one single drop back. Cincinnati couldn't get to Mayfield. The last two weeks for the Bengals, Phillip Rivers and Baker Mayfield have torn them apart, like picked them to shreds. I, you know, that's your sign right there. Right. Uh, that's right. Yeah. So Ryan Tannehill, have yourself a day next week. Yeah, oh, he's going to go crazy. And, and or, you know, Henry may just bludgeon them instead. But either way, it's going to be a good a good choice for them. But it's true. When Rivers and Mayfield look like pro bowlers, it's, you know, it's probably not Rivers and Mayfield. It's probably right. the, the defense. And it's so obvious what I'm saying, but people think, oh, this quarterback is so great. Oh, he sucks this year. He's great this year. Matt Ryan sucks last year. He's good again. He's bad again. Like, dude, just these quarter. I mean, I'm not saying all quarterbacks are exactly the same, but pretty much a competent NFL quarterback will carve you up. Look at Kirk Cousins when he has time to throw. Will carve your ass up if he's got time to throw. And, you know, that's just, that's the whole game. And why do they, why do we, why do teams invest so much in left tackles and edge rushers? Why are those routinely after the quarterback, the highest paid and the highest picked players? Because right. those guys create the quarterback or destroy the quarterback. That's, the, that's their jobs. It is. And uh, there's a thread going around Twitter talking about Aaron Donald and whether he can handle the run and what the splits are. It's like his job is to create havoc. That's what he does. They, and they take him out sometimes because like, you know, it's a rotation like everybody else. He could play the run, but that's not what they want him to do. That's not what he is not a run stuffing defensive tackle. He is a guy that's supposed to create havoc and just blow things up. Yeah. If you get the rush from the middle, uh, it's really tough because most quarterbacks, pocket passers step forward, right? I mean, you see Brady or Breeze or all the, all the great pocket passers, the rush comes from the edge and you step up in the pocket. They create, that's what the pocket is. It's like a, mm -hmm. a boundary to protect the quarterback. You step up and step into the throw. And again, it's like hitting a tennis ball. If you, you, if you have it so you can step in and use your proper motion, not back foot bailing out, you know, but really step through the throw, uh, you're probably going to be accurate. You've done it a million times. But if you get the push from the middle, good luck. There is nowhere right. to go. You step in, you get crushed. So like, you know, if you're Pat Mahomes or Russell Wilson, you can escape maybe. But that's why the, that, that push from up the middle is so devastating. Yeah. Speaking of that, you know, did you notice, like, all of a sudden, overtime, Wilson had no time to throw. You know, right. all of a sudden, Arizona figured out, oh, we know how we can blitz them and confuse them on our blitzes, where they couldn't do that all game prior to that. It was weird. The game, it was so, Seattle, every game with the Seahawks is so weird, but this yep. was the weirdest game I've ever seen. One of the weirdest games of all time. Like, overtime, when, there were so many, like, shifts in overtime usually overtime's like one drive and it's over or there's one drive and then a field goal and it's over or there's a couple drives and the teams both suck and it's a tie or something it's never like one team's almost certainly going to win and then all of a sudden the tables turn and then it was like the most bizarre back and forth the, the cardinals had four minutes left they were down 10 and they're running the ball yeah and they're i'm like what are you doing like what i i was like talking to the to the screen this morning because i watched it on the rewind i was like what are you doing like go what are you even thinking I, I did not understand it and they got that roughing the passer or something they, they would kick the field goal and they got that i didn't even see if it was legit or not but that got them they were going to kick the field goal and that would have they did kick the, the field goal it yeah. was good and they yeah. took points off the board um right. it was, i mean that was a huge play uh right. it, so this it's roughing just... the passer thing puts me in line for the cover again they get the touchdown then seattle gets the ball on on third and two they hand it to carlos hyde then they punt right and they they get the they give uh arizona the ball back rather than just trying to get russell wilson put in his hands and let him get a first down and then it's just the whole thing was so crazy that over time they ice their own kicker who makes it he misses it seattle's got the metcalf touchdown that's called back russ throws a ridiculous interception they get back and they score again and even even like even the last play in overtime before the field goal they lost like five or six yards you remember that they tried to run it and they lost a bunch of yards yep yep Wild game. You know, Seattle and Arizona in particular against each other play weird games. Remember there's like that low scoring overtime game. It was like 12 to nine or nine to six or something like that. It was so bad. It was art. Uh, it, it was one of those. Uh, I vaguely remember it. I think I've deleted it from my, and Pete Carroll is such a, he's such a like good and bad coach at the same time. Yep. That's why he's in all these weird games. Like he's not a coward. who's willing to take chances um, they finally let, you know, the let Russ cook thing is obviously good. And, you know, some of the play design and the offense is good. But then, like, the clock stuff, he's always wrong about. He's always punting, like, foolishly. 
Yeah. He's such a weird coach. Like it's like he's he's like in a dimension that's like it's not like he's in the Belichick Harbaugh Andy Reid level, but he's like in this, his own dimension where he's good, but he does strange stuff, and that's why the games are weird in part because they don't close him out when they should close him out. I mean, Seahawks should have won that game, and they just couldn't close it out. Right. I I think they. And I know like the interception uh, he threw in the end zone was targeted to Metcalf, but it was kind of like an attempt at a throwaway and he just missed it. Uh, but they didn't, they just gave up on throwing to Metcalf because of Patrick Peterson. I, I, it was almost like they, they gave him too much credit. I know everything was working with Lockett so much early right. on. I think that was it. But I think in the second half, they went away from what works. And yeah. yeah. They went into a shell a little bit. They didn't. They weren't as aggressive. They weren't. You know, once the Cardinals were down, you know, I, I think when you're up ten and you have offenses like that and defenses like that, also go up seventeen. I mean, right. you don't want to use clock and punt. I mean, it's the Belichick like, way. Yeah, it's just just best defense is a good offense. Just keep the ball, keep scoring, and don't take it for granted. And that that is true. And I agree with you. I mean, I think Metcalf's unstoppable. Russ throws those rainbow bombs and. Who's going to interfere with him? Uh, but yeah, early in the game it was just Lockett was so was going so insane. It was open every play. Yeah, it's like Game of Thrones when you have a guy down, finish him. Don't yeah. do anything anything for style points. Don't do anything. Oh just... yeah, like uh, yeah, the mountain. Spoiler yes. alert. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's it's not too soon anymore, is it? No, 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 no. It's not. Yeah. Uh, speaking of the Seahawks, Chris Carson has a midfoot sprain. Uh, just MRI just came back. Seems like he'll miss some time. Although we thought he'd miss time after that Cowboys hit on him too. You know, I guess that should have been our sign though, too. That Cowboys game was as close as it was. And the Cowboys are just awful. That you know, maybe that Seattle, you know, even though they are undefeated, they're not that great anyhow. They're they're how, offense. How about is. the Patriots? How about the Patriots almost beat them? Should yep. have beat them. Yep. At the one foot line. The Patriots suck. Yeah. I mean that you know, everyone's like, I thought, oh wow, Cam's gonna be a monster this year. Look how good he looks. But maybe that wasn't the correct takeaway. Maybe the correct takeaway was anybody can uh, can go crazy against the Pat, against the Seahawks. Yeah, I guess so because boy, they they haven't shown it since then. And at the the week after, they just ran the ball a ton against the Raiders. So we're like, okay, it's just Belichick game planning. All right, fine. Uh, then they had COVID, um, and they, they, I, I, that Chiefs game was just a giant anomaly. Uh, and then they the, the following week, okay, fine. They had one day of practice. What's the excuse this week? I mean, the Niners are good, but they're not world well, beaters. Well, my, my excuse is that, well, the Niners, though, are really good when they're good. Yeah. But that, another strange team that, you know, they killed the Giants and Jets. Okay, those teams suck. But those road games with no, you know, down a lot of players killed them. Then they get beat by the Eagles at home. Eagles are pretty bad. And then, the, you know, the Giants should have beat the Eagles. They're up 21-10 with four minutes left. Yeah. And then the Dolphins just kill them in their own building. And you're like, wow, the Niners kind of suck. Yeah. <laughs> Go into New England and just annihilate them. Now we're like, oh, the Patriots kind of suck. But my excuse for the Patriots would be that Cam signed late. He doesn't know the system that well. There was no real full training camp. Uh, so him getting COVID. So remember, the team had to miss, but he missed even more because that Hoyer game, Cam was already like missing practice and already you know quarantined. Right. So he's missed even more practice. And so he's the one who needed it the most because he's still as the quarterback picking up the offense and doing all that kind of stuff. So he just looked crappy though. His arm looked like Eli Manning thrown in the ground, like missing open guys. And just, he just, he just didn't look sharp. Yeah. And let's face it though. They also, their, their team, their receivers are terrible. I mean, oh, don't tell Ted Bell that he's going to say they're so talented. Their receivers are terrible. They are the worst receiving core in the NFL. Julian Edelman's 34 and playing hurt. Nikhil Harry, I think he got hurt also, is just terrible. He never makes a play. And then Demir Bird and, like, uh, Jacoby Myers. Who are these guys? Right, right. They, you know, Bell Nikhil Harry went in the concussion protocol early uh, in that game. It, it might have helped a little bit. They have one, The receivers have one touchdown and eight interceptions when they're targeted. Think about that. Yeah, they're terrible. And then James White missed a couple of weeks, and then 
You know, who, they like, trotting out like Burkhead and James White and <laughs> Keel Harry. It's just such a like low octane offense. It's yeah. so low octane. There's just no playmakers on that team. And Cam can. I mean, they, their defense would have to be like, you know, the 2000 Ravens and let Cam just sort of caretake, make right. plays with his legs. And then like Edelman catch a seven yard pass and then Harry box people out because he's pretty big. The, it's just that, you know, the, maybe Damon Harris looked all right. He showed a spark that that one week and uh, Beast Head is, is useful in a utility role. I mean, they're all OK, but yeah, if Cam unless Cam's playing really well, the offense isn't going to go anywhere. Yeah, they, they, the tight ends they drafted, none of them have made an impact at all. And granted, rookie tight ends rarely make an impact, but the opportunity is there. I mean, it's just when Ryan Izzo is your leading tight end with 12 catches and 90 yards, you know, it, it, it's ugly. It's ugly all around. So, yeah, I don't know, man. Looking at them, they're going to, you know, I, I, I've i written out my matchups so I won't get spoiled on guest lines. I'm going to do it before the Monday night game this week just just so I can watch the Scott Van Pelt Sports Center not be spoiled on the lines. But right. the Pats are going to be they're going to be underdogs against Buffalo this week. I'm pretty sure of that. Where's the game? Buffalo. Oh, uh, they'll be getting like six maybe, but Buffalo looks like crap too. Yeah, it's gonna be inter- I yeah. I, mean, I don't know. I just made that up. Maybe five, I'm gonna think about it, but like maybe four. Who knows? But Buffalo got killed by Tennessee. Showed they were outclassed. They got killed by the Chiefs. Got totally outclassed. Like they were four and zero. Was like, oh, maybe Buffalo's in the same class as the Chiefs and the Titans. And it was like, oh no, they're not. Right. And then. Uh, they didn't get killed by the Chiefs, but they got soundly beat. Yes, and then they they outga- got outgained two to one. Yeah, they got yeah, killed okay. by them. They got killed. And then the uh, the Jets were like toe to toe with them basically the whole game. I mean, I, it, they pulled away. Like, well, let, let, toe to toe is you know they had four offensive yards. They didn't they go. Did. But a, a touchdown, a two point conversion on the last. That's drive one big ass toe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, you know, the thing is, the, but the Bills are off right now. And I know they're missing John Brown. They're not getting much out of the running game, but they had eight field goal attempts. That's just one. Yeah. That's not going to hold. you you got to be right. able to finish. Yeah, especially against the Jets. Yeah, who they blew out the first time, too. I'm going to, you know, I, I, I did get some pushback last week uh, saying, hey, you need to downgrade Josh Allen after how he looked the last couple weeks. It's like, well, you know what? They're facing the Jets, so not so fast. Now I'm going to have to. I don't know how oh, long I'm going to have to push him. The season long. I have him below uh, Justin Herbert. I have him. I mean, he's still good. He's still going to get the rushing floor. And, and he at least has established that he's a, a real passer now. He's not like just a running quarterback who occasionally throws. He's graduated into he can throw when he needs to. Okay. And maybe John Brown is better than we think. Cole Beasley had a big game and because they kind of like took away digs a little bit. And then. But maybe having that third guy who's really good and you know connected with the quarterback is is kind of important to them. They also had a tight end COVID outbreak. They had one healthy tight end, Tyler Croft, Dawson Knox, and like two other active tight ends were all you know Knox was positive, and then the other like two other like other guys were scratched because they were in close contact with them. The only reason Tyler Croft wasn't was because he was on paternity, like he and his wife was having a baby, so he was with her on the day that he got diagnosed or whatever. Um, so that, I guess that might take away some of your options, your blocking options takes away some of the running lanes. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, but still, it, 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 it's not what you expect. They won. And that's all, about all you can say. They did not cover the jets covered Rufus lives. Uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll see about that. Saints didn't cover though. I had the saints, oh. I had the jets and the saints, the saints, you know, they were lucky to win. I mean, Joey Sly, 65 yard attempt, Falls a couple yards short. I was rooting for it, even just because it would have been cool. Although I did have the Saints in my as my survivor pick, but the Saints, I still kind of think the Saints are good. But they just they just allow more points than a good team, a good defense should. And you know yeah. the Panthers are okay, but you were talking about on the show that Lattimore got beat pretty easily, and usually he doesn't. And uh, you know Teddy Bridgewater looked good to me. That was the takeaway I had from that game. I watched a lot of that game. He pulls and, uh, it down and scrambles a little too much for my liking, and he's not fast enough fast. to be able to do yeah. that. Uh, but that's also probably a function of the offensive line, maybe not giving him enough time. But he, he it feels like to me he can't make the play and then throw. You know, he can't buy the time and then throw. Where if he pulls it down, he's going. 
Uh, that's the way I see it. Well, I, he made some great throws under pressure on the run. Did Mike, he? And okay. I, he was, no, yeah, I, have to, and I haven't rewatched nine, that game 9. yet. 9.1 YPA, two touchdowns, no picks, and made some tough throws and under duress. And there was there was duress. Like, he, he was getting rushed a decent amount. And, uh, you know, they took away the run game entirely, so he had no, mm -hmm. you know, he, he didn't have the cushion of that. He was just throwing the ball and, and kept him close. He, he looked pretty good to me. I mean – kind of good like in the Mayfield way where he can make some plays and move around, but he's not a good enough athlete to right. really scare you, you know? And, and then if you're not an athlete, if you're like Mayfield or Bridgewater, you know, they're not like statues, but they're not athletic. If you're like those guys, you better be like Tom Brady good in the pocket or Drew Brees good, you know, cause that's, you're, you're giving away a huge advantage in the modern NFL. That's true. That's true. Uh, speaking of Drew Brees, you take away his top two receivers Still moves the ball pretty well, I thought, all things considered. Uh, you know, it was, it was annoying that uh, Cam Kamara got a touchdown pulled away from him. Uh, then, you know, it, other people it just jumped in. Uh, but, like, it was Callaway. It was Harris. You know, it, it was Jared Cook getting a touchdown. Um, you know, it, it was, they got by. And they're only – they're four and two still, game behind the Bucks, and they beat the Bucks. The Bucks are still the class of the division, plus 80 in their scoring so far this year. They look really tough. Well, what they did to Green Bay was pretty big. And that was yeah. a big win. And then going into Oakland on the road, which Oakland just beat the Chiefs in Kansas City, you know, before the bye. That's flexing some muscle. And also, like, their loss was to the Saints. Mm -hmm. And that was early. They almost lost to the Chargers, and we we're like, oh, the Bucks are a fraud. But then we realized, oh, Justin Herbert is legit. So right. it doesn't look quite as bad. And... They're, they look good, and Brady's now, you know, they're going to get Antonio Brown. Brady's got so many weapons. He looks good. Fournette and Ronald Jones both look good, but I wish it were just Ronald Jones. And it's, uh, yeah, they, they're one of the favorites, man. It's like it's like them. Like in the NFC, they're probably the favorite. In the AFC, Chiefs and Titans and Ravens, those three teams probably still the— Not the Steelers? I put them fourth, even though they're the only undefeated team left in the NFL— the Titans were better. Ben in that second half when the Titans made their run could not convert uh, any drives. That's why the Titans came back. They kept having to punt or they had turnover and, you know, Juju's getting all these targets and even Deontay Johnson who got two touchdowns and all these targets, but it was all dink and dunk. There was one 28 yard play to Juju, but most of the eight dot is like right around the line of scrimmage. Yeah. So it wasn't, I don't know if the Titans did that on purpose If Vrabel set it up so that they had to do that, but they stifled them in the second half and the Steelers could have put that game away if they had just scored more, or got some first downs, but they couldn't do it. So, uh, I, I, I don't think the Steelers defense is really good, but offense is more important. So I'd agree with I'll that. Put them, I'll put them forth. They should have t targeted Claypool more. And then my ranking was not, my ranking on Claypool wouldn't have been they so should bad. Have done that, Jeff. Maybe they'll learn their lesson for having almost lost. Yeah. I'll teach them. Because my ranking is way more important than their uh, their result, that's for sure. They they care about that. They do. They clearly do. I'll talk to Tim Benz, my Thursday radio guy from Pittsburgh, about that. But uh, we'll see what we can get in place. I'm looking at the standings right now. The NFC East, every team in the in the division has a negative 30 plus differential. Every team in the NFC West is plus 31 or better. Uh, just interesting, and they and some of that's against each other too. Uh, the Eagles, they still make mistakes. I mean, the, the Giants were right in that game Thursday night until the what very you mean, end. Right in it, they were up twenty-one to ten. They weren't in the game; they had it won. I know. Just... Evan Ingram holds on to the ball. Uh, it's Evan all Ingram. over. Don't get me started, Evan Ingram. How bad of a football player, Evan! What Ingram. a drop! I mean, what a horrible it's not just drop! Just a drop on, on the interception, and I saw the the next day one, so I'm not sure exactly what happened, but it was it hit it it tipped off of Ingram the interception. There was another interception early in the year where Ingram didn't like break back for the ball that hard. No. He's always hurt. He's always like, he's not a good blocker. But he's the play I'm talking way. about is the third down play in the fourth quarter. Yeah, of they get a first down. They sit, they run out the clock. It's over. In Game's territory. entirely yeah. over. I know. He just dropped it on the sideline. Ah, oh, brutal. He's terrible. I've, to I've told people that for the last several. I'm like, this guy just, you know. I saw two leagues where he got spite dropped. I don't know. They must have had him on their bench because usually you can't drop a guy that's already played. But right. I saw him get dropped in two leagues, like on Friday. It was like, right. I've had enough. I'm out. <laughs> yeah, he sucks. 
he, he's just not a good football player. You know, it, it's just you, you can have all the athleticism in the world. I'm learning this. Like, I, I just assume all these guys are really good at football and then you'd have this, like, advantage by size and speed. Like, you know, if you were big and fast and powerful, you're, you know, it'd be like DK Metcalf. They're like, oh, he, he's not agile in the combine, so we're going to let him fall to the end of the second round. And I'm like, no, if this guy can just, like, run a route and catch a pass, he's just too much of a beast for any of the defenders to handle it. But I'm kind of finding out that's the exception, right? That DK Metcalf, even though he's not, like, laterally agile, at least according to the combine metrics, uh, probably is a really good football player. Like, he, he just knows what he's doing. Whereas the Evan Ingrams of the world that have sort of the Metcalf-esque freak size-speed combo aren't good football players. Then you have so many receivers these days Instead, you know, it used to be Terrell Owens, Randy Moss, you know, Calvin Johnson, Julio Jones, Andre Johnson. These just total uh, specimens were the, were the class of the league. But nowadays, it's like DeAndre Hopkins, Michael Thomas, Devontae Adams, Keenan Allen. Yeah. These guys are like technicians, route runners, and they're, you know, they're not really fast. They don't make a lot of huge plays down the field. The Hopkins made one last night, but it's rare. Um, they... Uh, they're not like so physical. I mean, Devonta Adams is pretty stout. He's like 6'1", 215, but he's not like, you know, he's not a monster like Metcalf. Um, but these guys are the, they have football skill. They don't have that like right. freak athleticism, but they have football skill. And, you know, I want obviously both, if I can, someone who can break open a game like Odell Beckham. The problem with Odell Beckham is he's like a sports car. He's too fragile. He just can't, in the last few years, it's just, he couldn't, you know, first few years he was great, but I want a guy who can break the game open, Tyreek Hill, you know, someone like that, peak Antonio Brown. But uh, but the truth is, like, these sort of football technician guys have taken over as the the type, the style of preference among the, you know, top 15 or 20 receivers in the league. Isn't and that why who, Moss and Owens were unicorns, though? I mean, because they had it all. They had the size, the Calvin speed, Johnson, and the Andre talent. Johnson, yeah. Calvin Johnson, Andre Johnson. You know, there were a bunch of them. Uh, and, but that was, those are the guys who took over, you know, like those were the, who was the number one receiver every year it was Calvin Johnson or Andre Johnson for like five years. Right. And then okay. Beckham came in the league after that and he was an Antonio Brown. So you had this small, they, they, they changed up the rules of what DBs could do. And now like the guy who was small and quick and could change directions on a dime, but also take it to the house, um, was unstoppable because you couldn't, you couldn't knock him off his route. I mean, they were calling much more stuff. You couldn't grab, grab and clutch as much, but now it's not even those guys. I mean, there are some of those guys still like Stefan Diggs is kind of one of those guys and there's, there's still good players like that, but you know, Tyler Lockett, Tyree kill, but the prototype number one receiver now is this dude who's like six, two, two ten, and runs a four, five, five, one runs a four, five at best, mm -hmm. but has incredible hands. No, you know, it's on the same page as this QB and knows how to run a route. And they, they're not like that efficient on a per play basis, but they just make all the catches. Michael Thomas, you know, Hopkins. Yeah. Keenan Allen, Devonte Adams, Robert Woods is like the poor man's version of that. You know, he's sort of like that. Right. To your point about Hopkins, I saw him, you know, he got wide open on a play and got tracked down by a linebacker. Yeah. No, he's slow. He's not, he ran like a four five something. And he's, you know, that was at the combines six, seven years ago. I mean, he's, he's not fast. Right. Not definitely not as fast as uh, some of those out there. That's for sure. Not, not wide receiver fast. That's, that's for no, sure. It's not you know, DK Metcalf is fast. Terry right. McLaurin is fast. Those are, you know, those are the AJ Brown is only like a four, four, nine. Although the combines on everything. AJ Brown is so thick that when he catches one of those slants, it looks like a tight end. And then you're like, okay, he caught a slant. He's going to get tackled. Then all of a sudden he starts running away from the defense. And you're like, oh, he's going to, they're not going to catch him on this play. Oh yeah. That they're play like, against the Steelers yesterday. Whew. Man, he took one step and you're like, oh, he's gone. He's yeah, gone. But he, he looks slow because he looks like a tight end because he's so thick. I mean, he's yep. at 230. But they weren't gaining. The other they were not gaining at all on they him. That's for sure. well, how about Danny Dimes outrunning those DBs and just tripped? Yeah. He just couldn't outrun the 15 yard line. You know, it was a 20 yard line that he tripped on. Yeah. 20s, you know, there was a little uh, trip wire there. But Danny Dimes, his speed was the 15th highest speed of any ball carrier in the NFL this year. I know. Faster than Tyreek Hill's fastest. I know. It's crazy. And, yeah, you know, the weird part about that play was how wide open it was. Like, oh, yeah. He just did a bootleg and he was gone. Yeah. It was like, what, what, 
what happened here? I mean, did everyone bought the fake? It was crazy. There was one guy who's probably supposed to be there just in case and didn't do his job. Yeah. And there, and you could see him just looking around and all that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Um, I was impressed with the Packers yesterday. I was impressed with, uh, you know, playing without Jones, playing without one of their starting offense alignment. Uh, they just came in and just throttled them right away. And, you know, the, both sides of the ball. Now, Bradley Roby got hurt early for Houston, and I think that was a pretty big deal. Uh, but it doesn't explain Houston's problems on offense. They, I was really disappointed there because they had been rolling the last couple of weeks. There's no coherence to the offense. It's, it's Deshaun Watson running around and slinging it to a bunch of different guys, none of whom were – all of whom were okay, none of whom were great. Yep. You know, Will Fuller kind of shows up, goes away. Cooks is good and quick. Um, Cobb is a nice nifty slot type of guy, but there's nobody that you're like, oh, we got to stop this guy. And then David Johnson's just a guy at this point. Duke Johnson may get more work eventually, but who knows? They're just there's no, you know, cohesion. It just seems like they're a little bit like the Cardinals. Like it's just this herky jerky, sort of slinging around. There's no like rhythm to the offense where they're just kind of driving down the field, moving yeah. the chains like a like a good Chiefs drive, you know, set up by Andy Reid. Because their runs always suck. Every time they yeah. run the ball in the middle of the middle of the pile, it just doesn't do anything, and they do it way too often. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I I think you know I think the running game is important because you can't have your passer get killed. Right. And you need the defense to honor it. Maybe you do it a third of the time or whatever. At least, you know, third to a half. And passing is a half to two thirds, probably. You know, that's a pretty wide range, but that's mm-hmm. the range, right? And and but that it, you know, since you do have to run it a decent amount, the, the success rate of those runs is important. Like, yeah. to get a success rate that's high, so it's second and five, second and four, uh, and and you're smashing into them, and and your offensive line's attacking the defensive line and wearing them down. I think that's a big difference from second and eight. I mean, just think of the, you know, we know this from from baseball, right? If it counts one and two or zero oh and two, batters in a hole, the OPS in those counts is way worse than when it's two and one, three and one, two and zero. Oh way better and i'm sure it's the same thing when it's second and nine you know third and 11 it's terrible right the 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 ypa and the success rate whereas if it's third and two or second and five you know, the whole playbook's open and I, I think it's probably the same thing and so we, we might look at like I don't, I don't know how they measure when they say oh the running back well there's two things running backs don't matter which is individual backs and then the second claim would be running game doesn't matter in other words um running play success and I, I mean running play success has to matter i agree regardless if you think you know what you think about individual backs i right. also think the individual back matters but the running game includes the offensive line and, and all of that right yeah and i you know i you don't have to establish the run to establish the pass you don't have to do that just some semblance of balance is what we're looking for here uh it makes play action all that much more effective you know, if you throw the ball on first down every time, they're not going to buy the play action. Why you don't bother doing it? It doesn't hold the linebackers. But if you have some credibility with the running game, just a little bit, it'll help. Uh, so, yeah. Well, I, I, I'll give you a good, you know, there's a thing called Wittgenstein's rule of Wittgenstein. Ludwig Wittgenstein was a philosopher. And he said that if you have a ruler that's measuring something, be sure you, the thing that you're measuring is also measuring the ruler. Mm-hmm. So if I have a ruler that's a foot long and uh, – they're not going to take this to any uh, place that it shouldn't go. And uh, you're measuring something, you know, that should, you know, not be that big. I'm really not trying to take this anywhere. You'll be like, wait, this is the wrong measurement. The ruler's broken. Like the, the, the gradations of this ruler are wrong. Um, so the thing measures the ruler also. So if you have a model that says, the, you know, never run, it doesn't make sense. Or the running game is, is totally stupid. And then you have six-time Super Bowl winner, not including the Giants Super Bowls, Bill Belichick running the ball some games like 70% of the time, some games 10, 20% of the time, but you know, often running a lot and drafting running backs. You might want to check the ruler. Yep. You, know, you might want to say, uh, I'm not saying that Belichick, the argument from authority that no matter what he does is right, but if you're just some dude building a model on Excel or so, even you know, in a more c- complex model in a programming language, and it says this thing that the smartest people who actually have the most skin in the game are doing d- do not agree with it all. None of them, not a, not one. 
maybe you're some super genius that's figured out something that, you know, it's possible, right? But we don't want to, again, just have the argument from authority, but it may be that your model's missing some real life, not data, but experience. Right. Where these guys, it's like, oh, you're telling me you should, you know, they run, you should run 10% of the time or 20% or that, you know, running backs don't matter. And yet everybody else, you know, Dobbins gets drafted. Sony Michelle gets drafted. I'm not saying those two guys are good picks. You can pick bad picks from any, and we don't know about Dobbins yet. But uh, it's sort of like the best in the game are doing this. You know, Andy Reid takes CEH. Belichick, Jake, Belichick takes Sony Michelle. Uh, you know, Harbaugh takes Dobbins. It's not like Adam Gaze is out there doing these deci- making these decisions, right. right? It's not like Adam Gaze is the guy, only guy taking running backs. And so, of course, of course, look, you know, it's you, you have to come up with a something that explains why they wouldn't understand it when they're looking for every possible edge. When the when the Ravens are very advanced in their analytics and, and doing things that are sort of cutting edge, right? Um, it, so the, the whole thing is just so. I don't know why I'm banging this drum so much on this podcast, but I just. I keep thinking about it, and it's just like it's so stupid, like the, the line of reasoning. But right. it's a good thing that the concept of Wittgenstein's ruler, where it's like if what you're measuring, you're like, oh, my, my calculations say this, and they must be right, doesn't comport. The thing is also measuring you. The, the, thing you're, right. the data is also measuring the model. The model's not just measuring the data. If you come up with a theory that says, you know, Ronald Cunha should go in the fourth round next year, maybe you want to rethink your model. You know, maybe the, it, the result is also measuring the model. It's it's like the uh, system that said that Ryan Tannehill was the most valuable player in that Pats Titans game. Yes, yes. you know, right. yeah, you better check. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you're not your model somehow seems to be broken. You know, it yeah. just right. But anyway, and, and, and it's just it's just a good thing to keep in mind. Yeah, uh, it's funny you mentioned the Pats and then you know Belichick. We were talking about all the problems New England's having. Contrast that with Tampa Bay. You know the you know who. You know, we don't necessarily want to say, okay, well, it, was, it was Brady, not Belichick. It might be. It look, looks pretty good. And now they're adding Antonio Brown, uh, which I don't know how that's going to work, but it's just one more talented player. It makes it a nightmare for fantasy, but it's pretty darn good if you're a Bucks fan. Yeah, it's cool. I actually have a bet with Dalton. I bet on the Bucks versus the Patriots. And when Cam got signed i was like ah oh, damn it like i bet when stidham was going to be the quarterback right right Dalton was foolish enough to bet on jared stidham patriots over the bucks so i said okay i'll take that bet and then he was talking yang about it in addition which is just uh, horrible but then they signed cam and i was like oh i'm gonna get screwed because they're you know the wind total just went up one or something when they got cam and then after the seattle game i was like uh-oh cam looks like he's completely healthy and great i'm gonna get screwed on this and the bucks had lost to the saints looked pretty bad brady didn't look that good but now I'm feeling, I mean, don't, don't ever, uh, you know, count your chickens when you're going against Belichick who makes the adjustments, but still, uh, that the you know, bucks look like a, almost a shoe in to be better than the Pats. Right. All right. Uh, is this the end of the, uh, Pats reign in the AFC East? Does Buffalo take it this year? They got a two game lead and they're playing each other this week. Well, don't, don't sleep on another, uh, team in that division. Miami uh, at Tua. Yeah. Making yeah, his debut knows? this week. I'm excited Buffalo's about that. Not that good. Buffalo is like a nine win team. I think. You know, the yeah. defense hasn't looked. I know Tredavis White was out for a bit, but uh, Buffalo has a negative point differential right now. You know that? They're minus four. That's crazy. So the Dolphins are plus 47, and a lot of that 47 came in San Francisco. That's true. So, I mean, the Dolphins right now are probably the better team, you know, or at least, you know, close to it. We'll see what two it brings. Maybe really good right away. And then never sleep on the Pats, right? Because they're going to play twice. Right. So that's you know, they're right there. That can e- even it up. We just know what team is definitely not going to win. We just know that there's one team not going to win. Yeah. Minus 118 so far for the Jets. That's crazy. Uh, we'll finish out with another news item. Uh, Kenyon Drake uh, has been diagnosed with uh, torn ligaments in his ankle. He'll miss at least a few weeks. They're on by this upcoming week, but it is totally Chase Edmonds' season. Uh, and Edmonds is the better looking back, though, too. I mean, it's just... You know, Drake had another hideous drop uh, in the passing game. He's just slower. It takes a while. Edmonds just goes. It's, it's, it, you yeah. can tell it's a big difference. So remember in draft season, like people had Drake, you know, end of first, early second. And it was like, well, I mean, look how good he was in the second half last year. And it looks a little like the Amos zero way or even worse, Kevin Barlow syndrome right. where you're really fresh. He wasn't used much in Miami. He goes fresh in the second half. 
He, it's a small sample. He has four touchdowns in one game against a weak opponent. The overall stats look great. And then, oh, well, now you're the feature back the whole year, starting week one. And, and then he got himself team. hurt in training camp, too. And I don't think he was ever really 100%. But that doesn't – I mean, that it's done now. I mean – yeah, it's tough, you know, and we're, we're almost like, you know, in the last week, you know, he had the, the big run against the Cowboys late and they gave up on the play. It's like, hey, no one really thought he's fixed, but they're like, well, OK, that cements that he's going to get the job for a while. And he did really. He was the guy. Um, but that now this happens and you could just see the difference. It was night and day. Edmonds was the better back. But yeah, we'll see what happens now with Edmonds, if he's Amos Zeroway or if he's actually like Arian Foster stepping in. Right. I mean, sometimes they are. Sometimes Edmonds has always kind of been good as like a fill-in. Yeah. But yeah, it's a whole different thing. Kevin Barlow was great as a fill-in to Garrison Hurst. And then I think it was Garrison Hurst. I could be wrong on who that was. But anyway, then he get the start and that was the end of that. It was. Uh, what are you working on for East Coast offense this week? I don't know. I was going to write about all the misery in detail, but I kind of did that already in my uh, observations. Because I, the reason I didn't want to do it, but I just couldn't write about the games without getting it off my chest. I felt right. so like just disgusted with the, I, I just didn't want to think about football, but it's my job. So I have to do it. Mm -hmm. So I had to like bring myself into a state of mind to do it. So I just had to like dump it. So that was going to be East coast offense. And now I'm not exactly sure. I might, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll make up something. I was thinking about just the idea of this, which is that, um, you know how things are nonlinear, right? Like, yeah. you know, if you're like, well, things like not everything just, is like incremental linear so that like if you're going against like an average defense and then you go against like a 60th percentile defense like okay it might be a little harder but a 70th percentile might be it might be like an earthquake where that's like right twice as hard and then the 80th percentile is twice as hard as that and the 90th percentile is five times harder than that and if you go against like the top defense in the history of the league it's like a hundred times worse than the tougher than the 60th you know i don't know exactly and so we have all these metrics where we kind of just um, you know, we just kind of were like, all right, well, tougher defense, they allow X per play or, or just think of it this way, which uh, this might be too complex for me to express, but you need 10 yards for a first down, right? So if a defense allows like on average, like 4.8 yards per play, which is elite versus like six yards per play, which is bad. Um, the amount of times when that's your average play, they get a first down it at a certain point. It, it, it's not just like a little bit less. It's like, no, that average makes it so that like the chances of driving down the field go from like 70% or 80% to get a touchdown or field goal to like 20% because you just can't string together enough first downs with like a certain per play to get to the 10 yards. I'm not, and it, it's probably not linear. It's not just like it goes down. It, it might like drop significantly when you get below a certain average. Right. And suddenly it's like almost impossible to string together three first downs. Right. And that's, uh, you know, what you need to get to a field goal on average starting position. So, just little things like that, that I feel like we don't really, we just kind of look at everything sort of our presumption is like, you know, better is better. Worse is worse rather than it's exponentially better, exponentially worse. And it may skew a lot of our understanding about matchups and things. I don't know. It's I probably, it's probably too much of just an idea. That was something I'm thinking. I don't know. I'm going to make something up. All right. Online. I look forward to it regardless. So it should be good. Uh, we got the value meter tomorrow. We got uh, free agents from Kevin Payne. Uh, we've got the free agent podcast tomorrow with uh, Jake Latarski, Joe Bartle. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening to the Rotowire Fantasy Football Podcast. Chris and I will be back at you next Monday. Take care.